Uh, those who are here for the first time, and those of you who haven't paid much attention, you only need to remember one thing, that is capital. What is Korea's economic system? Korea's financial market is capitalist. The Korean constitution says the Republic of Korea shall be a democratic republic in Article 1. A democratic republic, in other words, it's up to the people. Article 2, sovereignty shall reside with the people. In Chapter 9, it prescribes that individuals can operate and inherit enterprises under a free market system. So, we're living in a capitalist market system. What then is most important in a free market system? It's capital. No one can ever succeed without capital. Capital, productivity, and income sums up the essence of capitalism. This theory can explain your success doing the atomy business, becoming a lawyer by passing the bar exam, and even winning wars. Who do you think would win if the US and Germany fought each other? The country with more capital would win. Then what is it that really matters? What is capital? There are many types of capital out there. So even though I've been talking about it for a while, this is still an introduction. Would it be possible to have high income just because you wanted to have it? It wouldn't be possible unless you had high productivity. In order to increase productivity, you must have capital. That's what really matters. What is capital? I want you to keep the concept of capital in mind all the time. First time visitors here today, if you can figure out what capital is available to you, you will have a solution to your current situation. We say times are changing quickly now, but really, they have always done so. It's not the strongest that survive, nor the most intelligent, but most responsive to change. Charles Darwin isn't the only one who said this. Almost all futurist scholars agree with it. If you can't adjust to the environment, you will not survive. Those who dwell on the good old days in these fast times are doomed to be left behind. Let's continue. You might have heard of the four books and the three classics. Among the books of poetry, history, and changes, the book of changes is foremost. It says, when a situation reaches its limit, one should change. What does reaching its limit mean? There are many different kinds of limits. Not making ends meet is a kind of limit and not being able to realize your desires is also reaching a limit. For example, you can't afford to send your children to study in America. That is also reaching the limit. You want to be good to your parents, but all you can afford is $100 a month pocket money. That's also a limit. For whatever reason, when reaching the limit, things must change. This book was written about 3,000 years ago. When one changes, one can pass without interference. You're now living in an interference situation. When one passes, they can continue on for a long time. This makes sense even in modern times. When a situation reaches its limit, one should change. When one changes, one can pass without interference. When one passes, they can continue on for a long time. Let me introduce a philosopher of science named Thomas Kuhn. He is one of the brightest minds of the 20th century. He invented the term paradigm. Paradigm comes from Greek. He coined it as a scientific term. Simply put, paradigm describes a way of viewing the world. Kuhn says, if you don't change how you think, you will never see things in a new way and your life will never change. 
In the olden days, people believed Earth was the center of the universe and the sun revolved around it. This was the geocentric solar system. People sailed around the oceans under this assumption. But a lot of things didn't make sense. According to geocentric theory, the North Star should have been over there, but it wasn't. Copernicus noticed that all of the planets had the same annual movements and thought that this could be because the Earth revolves around the Sun. The Sun is the center of our planetary system. Earth revolves around the Sun. This was a paradigm shift. It's a fundamental change in the basic concepts about how we perceive everything around us. What do these look like to you? Many of you have seen these before, right? I see some of you are puzzled and trying to figure them out. It really isn't very complicated. <laughs> what do these look like? <sighs> to some, they look like a vase. And to others, they look like two people facing each other. How about this one? It can be viewed as a bird or a rabbit. Can you see them? How many wooden bars are there? Three or four? <laughs> hmm. In psychology, this phenomenon is called point of view. Things appear differently depending on your point of view or perspective. Thus, it's not simply a matter of right or wrong, but a matter of perspective. Again, it's different, not wrong. This is why self-righteousness and stubbornness can be dangerous. For example, when a sponsor forces his way of doing things upon partners, it won't work because his way was done under different circumstances. Times and circumstances have changed, so doing things his way is not going to bring about the same successful results now. There's a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. These are seven things that successful people do habitually. In the introduction of the book, the author mostly focuses on explaining the concept of paradigm shift. He explains the seven habits based on the premise of the paradigm shift. In other words, without the paradigm shift, these habits make no difference and are of no use. He asserts that changing your perspective is of utmost importance. He dedicates most of the first chapter to explaining paradigm shift and moves on to the seven habits, and again in the last chapter, switches back to paradigm shifts. Without shifting of paradigm, the seven habits of successful people aren't going to get you anywhere. Then, what is it exactly to shift a paradigm, changing behavior or thinking? It's changing your way of thinking. It's not changing your actions, but changing your mind. What he emphasizes is the inside-out approach, which means to start with yourself. Private victories precede public victories. The outside-in approach doesn't provide solutions to problems and without shifting paradigms, you can't succeed. He says paradigms are like glasses. He stresses that the world appears according to the glasses you wear. Think of a sponsor who's wearing black glasses and imposing his wrong opinion on red roses to his partners. Wouldn't their lives be miserable? What kind of glasses should we be wearing? Transparent ones, which means being open-minded. Without being open-minded, your unreasonable paradigms can bring your partners to destruction. 
That's basically what he preaches. Come to think of it, the author almost appears to have had anatomy in mind while writing this book. Now, let's talk about the ostrich syndrome. The ostrich doesn't run away when faced with predators, such as lions or leopards, but instead buries its head and ignores the situation. When confronted by a crisis in these changing times, you must acknowledge its existence and find a way to overcome it. Having a crisis is like being chased by lions. You must face it head on, not pretending that it isn't even happening. Don't be complacent with what you have. You must keep driving forward. Here we see C.S. Lewis, who was a renowned British novelist and academic. He said, we are like eggs at present. We must be hatched or go bad. We can't go on indefinitely being just an ordinary decent egg. We must be hatched, mustn't we? If an exterior force is used to help hatch an egg, will it hatch faster? That is more likely to kill the egg. The egg must hatch on its own. The next example is with insects that shed their shells. Folks from the country have seen them shedding their shells, haven't you? Those insects go through what seems to be a very painful process. What would happen if a human tried to help the insect molt? <laughs> the insect would die. It must shed its shell on its own. Let's talk about the boiling frog theory. This theory was coined in the 19th century and has been tested in several experiments. Most modern biologists say it is untrue. However, this theory is still used in explaining shifts in thinking and culture. The idea is if a frog is dropped into boiling water, it will jump out. However, if the frog is put in tepid water, then brought to a boil slowly, it will not notice the danger and will be cooked to death. This is a metaphor for the inability or unwillingness of people to change themselves in response to gradual threats. There are some ladies who profess proudly that they went to Korea's top women's university. I answer to them, it doesn't matter that you went to the top woman's school if you aren't making good money. This is a prime example of a boiling frog. Those ladies went to that prestigious school a long time ago, yet are still coasting on that vain glory. The sad reality is that their pockets are empty. Again, those who think the changes are gradual can't see that in actuality they are very fast. They will be boiled to death. Some of you might be boiled to death if you insist on the old ways. Next topic. Baradin's donkey is one of the most important concepts in logic. One day, a starving donkey is wandering and discovers a haystack on its right side and another on its left. It dies of hunger since it can't make a rational decision. Oh, to choose one over the other. What this means is that if faced with two choices that are of significantly different value, people can make up their minds easily. However, if faced with two choices that are of very similar value, people then get lost in their decision-making and can't make up their minds eventually doing nothing. Aristotle came up with this idea. And it can be applied to economics as well. We all have to make difficult decisions when faced with such situations. Finally, we get to talk about capital. This woman's work is performed with her labor and the capital of a sickle. This is one kind of capital. In economics, capital is defined as a means of production. This man's work is done with his labor and the capital of a lawn trimmer. Who has higher productivity and whose work is harder? 
The woman's work is harder. Despite doing harder work, her low productivity brings her a low income. This is how capitalism works. This man is harvesting rice with his labor and the capital of a sickle. The other man is doing it with a tractor. Needless to say, this man's productivity is much higher by about 500 times. Who should be paid more then? In essence, the type of capital you're equipped with determines your productivity and your income. No matter how hard you work, you can't just match the productivity of the man with a tractor. Labor alone can't make it happen. You must have capital. Capital can be classified into two groups, tangible and intangible. Tangible capital are assets that have form, which typically includes land, buildings, factories, machinery, production equipment, and automobiles. Assets with form are considered tangible capital. Can the gentleman here please tell me? If you had inherited a nice rental building from your father, located in the most expensive commercial area in Korea, would you still be sitting here? You definitely wouldn't be. You could collect hundreds of thousands of dollars in monthly rent. Once you own tangible assets, they work all year round in a capitalist system to generate wealth. This is because capital generates productivity. But you don't have any. Next, I'm going to talk about intangible capital. Intangible assets have no form, yet they generate wealth. They are patents copyrights, and the human capital that I'm about to elaborate on. Yana Kim is said to earn $20 million in endorsements every year. Why would people pay her that much money? Let's say you tell the business owners that you don't need $20 million. <laughs> and would do the job for half the price. Would they hire you? If the advertisement cost $10 million, the sales would have to be at least $15 million to cover costs. Sales have to be a lot bigger than the advertisement costs. Do businesses want Yana Kim for her beauty? She possesses much more valuable human capital, giving her celebrity which symbolizes her as the queen of figure skating. She has capital known as symbolic capital. Could we just make up our minds to start practicing figure skating from today? That wouldn't work. That particular capital can't be reached. It's incredibly hard to accumulate such powerful capital. Symbolism or imagery is an unbelievably powerful asset. Let me ask this lady sitting here something. Would you like to have an off-brand purse or a Louis Vuitton? You definitely want a Louis Vuitton. Why is it that? There is absolutely no difference in the function of carrying things. Whether you carry your things in a Louis Vuitton or in an off-brand purse, there is absolutely no difference in the function of a purse, right? They just carry things. So why does a Louis Vuitton command a price tag of $2,000? That's how capital works. People buy Louis Vuitton for its image, not for its function, right?
people buy its symbolism and pay for the image it conveys. In economics, this is called the Veblen effect. The more expensive a product is, the more it is desired. I'm telling you, it's an economic theory. The fact of the matter is that you don't have that capital. What can you do? Those rental buildings in busy commercial areas just can't be gotten, can they? What can we do instead? We can gain human capital. Doing the atomy business requires us to have human capital. That's why I'm teaching all of you about intangible capital. All of you can earn money with this intangible capital and eventually wind up owning intangible capital. After making so much money, you can buy land, buildings, gold bars, Rolexes and bonds, which are all tangible assets, aren't they? Most of you are not equipped with such tangible assets. I'm sure some of you are. The whole process of accumulating this intangible capital is what we teach at Atomy seminars. You just can't do business without it. Now, ask yourselves what capital you're equipped with. You have to have some kind of capital, don't you? What you can afford is a social network, which is called social capital. Social capital is also an academic term. This network of people itself is classified as social capital. Social capital. The size and the quality of your social capital determines your income. First-time visitors can understand this at least, can't you? The size of your downlines decides your income and mastership. So, what does that make? It makes capital, social capital. It's invisible and connected by a human network. The human network is also social capital. For example, CM Jung Soo Park has as many as 100,000 members in her network, while some people have only two in theirs. Who would have the higher income, a two-member network or a 100,000-member network? So, the bottom line is that an Atomian's capital is social capital. To drive it home, the size and the quality of it determines your income. Therefore, this is the deciding factor. Then, what is the issue here? How can you expand it? How can you grow your network? What makes it bigger is human capital. Logos, pathos, and ethos, humility and listening. Three disciplines and united heart. Current economics classifies industry into three types. Primary, secondary, and tertiary. You've heard of this, haven't you? Economics call this entire industry a persuasion industry. You ought to learn some persuasion. Persuasion is a must in our profession, isn't it? You probably get rejected by 9 out of the 10 people you contact daily. What does that tell you? Your persuasion skills need work. This will teach you how to work on persuasion skills, logos, pathos, and ethos. Who in the world came up with this idea? Aristotle came up with this theory 2,300 years ago. According to him, persuasion requires these three elements to change people's minds. Logos is the logical persuasion ability that appeals to a person's rationale. How can you logically persuade someone? You must be knowledgeable about atomy. You must know things. You need expertise and wisdom. 
What does President Park always tell us? He says if you're not knowledgeable, you can't say anything. It's because Logos is only 10% of persuasion. Logic only counts for 10%. Not all of us are knowledgeable. The second element is pathos, which appeals to our emotions. Humans are equipped with something mysterious called emotion. We appeal to our emotions. You need to always be aware of the people you interact with. Let's say you sat down with a woman who has obviously had a fight with her husband and you told her that Hemohim would energize her husband. Would that be a suitable approach to a woman who's in a terrible mood because of her husband? <laughs> Pathos is the place for such emotions. That's why all experts say you should be a good listener. By being a good listener, you can understand who you're dealing with. No matter how logical you are, without appealing to their emotions, you will fail to move people's hearts. What was most important to Aristotle? Ethos is the most crucial element. It is the root of words like ethics. You need to have credibility that reflects your personality. Unfortunately, those who really need to hear this are not here. Anyone can succeed, but not everyone will succeed. If not everyone, then who will? Only the ones with capital will succeed. The fact that you have come here shows that you're in the process of accumulating capital, which will enable you to succeed, provided that you never give up. As long as you don't give up, this is an environment everyone can succeed in. Absolute quality, absolute prices, and an honorable system. However, if you can't succeed due to your individual situation, there will be no one to blame but yourself. I hope all of you become SMTs and RMs in three to five years. Thank you for listening.